Hello, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to another intensive gehotline.com live stream. And of course, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. If you are celebrating Christmas, um, of course, I wish you and your families a Merry Christmas. Now, let's get into today's topic. It's a topic that's been uh, much requested and been asked very often. And it is stages of coming out of a medically induced coma. Now, before we go into today's topic, uh, you may wonder what makes me qualified to talk about today's topic. I, I am a critical care nurse by background. I have worked in intensive care since 1999. That shows how old I am. Um, and I have worked in three different countries. I have worked as a nurse unit manager uh, in intensive care for over five years. I've been advocating and consulting for families in intensive care since 2013 as part of my intensivecarehotline.com, coming close to 10 years. Um, I am also the founder and director of Intensive Care at Home, where we provide intensive care at home nursing for long-term intensive care patients at home, predominantly on ventilation and tracheostomy. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, just some housekeeping issues. Please answer any questions you would like. Uh, type them in the chat, but I will also give you the opportunity to dial into the show at the end of today's topic. You know, you can keep the questions to today's topic, but you can also ask any questions about intensive care or intensive care related or intensive care at home related. So without further ado, let's dive right into today's topic, um, stages of uh, waking up, stages of coming out of a medically induced coma explained live stream. So induced coma obviously is a big topic in intensive care. One of the most frequently asked, well, probably the most frequently asked question we get as part of intensive care outline is, how long does it take to wake up after an induced coma? And of course, you know, as to, as part of today's live stream, we want to talk about what does it look like in particular? Are there stages, you know, that uh, you could talk about? And what I will also say today, I do not want to talk about stages coming out of a medically induced coma after a brain injury. I, I leave that out. That would be a whole separate live stream altogether. What does it look like coming out of a medically induced coma after hypoxic brain injury, anoxic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke. I'm not talking about that today. I'm talking about someone waking up after an induced coma in ICU that has no brain injury, no neurological event. Big difference. So therefore we need to start, you know, we need to start in even, you know, before you look at waking up, does it look differently waking up compared to what sedatives you're using, compared to what opiates you're using. And I'd say, yes, therefore, we almost need to break it down into three, four different streams of what it looks like waking up after medically induced coma, depending on what a patient in ICU is sedated with and what opiates are being used. Now, most patients in ICU that are ventilated with a breathing tube or an endotracheal tube in their mouth, um, are, in a, are induced into a medically induced coma because the breathing tube is very uncomfortable. Mechanical ventilation is very uncomfortable. You know, the ICU, most ICUs will, will argue that, um, most ICUs will argue that you can't ventilate someone in ICU with a breathing tube without a medically induced coma. Now, shout out to my friend, Kylie Dayton, who will uh, claim the opposite. She works in an ICU in Colorado, I believe, where they don't sedate patients in ICU and they ventilate them without a medically induced coma. And you should check out Kylie Dayton and her blog. Um, she has a lot to uh, offer. Okay, 
So again, let's look at the first scenario, which is when someone is induced into a coma on propofol or diprovan, as well as opiates such as morphine or fentanyl. That's a standard approach in ICU. And this standard approach is often short-term. So what do I mean by short-term? I'll give you an example. So a lot of patients uh, in ICU, for example, let's just say after open heart surgery, okay? The ideal scenario after open heart surgery in ICU is one night ICU, extubation, take the breathing tube out and then go to a hospital floor or a hospital ward the next day. That requires a short-term approach of sedatives, which ideally is propofol and some pain relief morphine or fentanyl. Day one of surgery, after surgery, take the breathing tube out, patient is hemodynamically stable, not bleeding, go to a hospital ward or a hospital floor or to a cardiac ward. So that's fairly straightforward. Why would you, why would you use, um, why would you use propofol in that situation? Propofol is short acting. So that means once you use propofol, you want to, you know, sedate the patient very quickly. And you also want to get them out of sedation very quickly. And that is why propofol works so well, right? You induce propofol and patients get, for lack of a better term, induced into a sleep, coma, knocked out, whatever term you want to use very quickly. The same happens ideally when you stop propofol. Patients will wake up within minutes. Again, this is, you know, sticking with the example of when someone comes into ICU after cardiac surgery, you know, you want to have this short, sharp onset but you also want to get people out of the induced coma very quickly. Right. So, main side effect of propofol is hypotension, low blood pressure. So the more propofol you use, you know, the higher chances are your loved one gets hypotensive or gets a low blood pressure. And therefore, um, you know, they need additional support such as inotropes or vasopressors for low blood pressure. And again, you want to avoid that because again, your goal is short-term medically induced coma, wake, wake and wean, wake and wean, what a nice term. So wake patients up, wean them off the ventilator, get them out of ICU, ideal scenario, okay? That happens with propofol and morphine or fentanyl. Again, I've taken the example of cardiac surgery that's not complicated and cardiac surgery can be very complicated, but I'm talking about a straightforward cardiac case here. Right. So let's just take the same patient after cardiac surgery. The goal is, you know, to wake and wean them, get them out of ICU day one, day two at the latest. But now you have complications, you know, God forbid the patient goes into an irregular heart rhythm. The patient has complications such as a bleed, you know, need to do a redo sternotomy. They need to open up the chest again because the patient is bleeding. And, you know, they take him back to, to theater, to the operating room. And then he comes back, patient comes back to ICU. It's very unstable, you know, very low blood pressure. You don't want to use any propofol because that's further contributing to the low blood pressure, especially if you use at high doses. Now you're switching over to midazolam or Verset, which is more of a long-term acting sedative and um, long-term acting sedative it's a benzodiazepine and it's addictive in nature if it's used over long periods of time uh, it's also unlike propofol when you switch it off patients tend to wake up much slower the half-life is much longer right the half-life of propofol is very short half-life of midazolam is much higher also, uh, if patients in ICU are in kidney failure or in liver failure, again, it, it takes much longer to get midazolam out of the system, right? Which could put a delay on patients waking up uh, in ICU, you know. The other complicating factor of midazolam is, again, 
it's addictive in nature, but it also is stored in, if someone is overweight, for example, it's there's a much higher incidence of midazolam being stored in the body tissue. And then, you know, staying in the system and delaying waking up. So those are issues around midazolam. The other thing that I've seen over the years is sometimes you use propofol and midazolam combined plus morphine or fentanyl. Again, you do do this if you're, for example, proning a patient. Okay, if you're putting a patient in prone position, maybe after ARDS, right? A lot of patients would have been proned in the last few years with COVID, COVID ARDS in particular. So, um, you know, and that often delays waking up as well. The more sedatives and opiates you use, the, the bigger the delay of waking up. Okay. So, next. In the last sort of 15 to 20 years, there's also been the introduction of Presidex or dexmedetomidine in ICU as a sedative. And according to research, dexmedetomidine or Presidex is both a sedative and opiate combined. And if you're using Presidex, apparently you don't need to use an opiate. Now, I have mixed experiences with Presidex. My experience is with some patients it works extremely well, and with others it doesn't work at all. But what we can confidently say is it's used more and more often, more and more frequently, and, um, you know, as I said, I have mixed experiences about the um, use of Presidex and the, the effectiveness of it. But what I can see is it probably has has less desirable side effects if it works compared to midazolam, propofol, morphine and fentanyl, because it's not addictive in nature. It's not a benzodiazepine, it's not an opiate. It does have clonidine in it, so it can cause bradycardia, low blood, a low heart rate and hypotension, low blood pressure. It can cause that side effect. It almost gives patients the ability to sort of stay semi-awake semi during intubation or other things that are happening in ICU. If it works, I think it's great. It gets patients to wake up quicker, generally speaking. Um, but as I said, my experience is it doesn't always work but it has less desire or fewer desirable. No, it has fewer non-desirable side effects. So if it can be used, I'm all for it. Okay, so that's that. Um, then let's look at another sort of unique situation in ICU. Again, I mentioned proning a minute ago. Let's just say someone needs proning. They're being heavily sedated with morphine or fentanyl, they're being heavily sedated with midazolam and uh, propofol, and they're often also paralyzed. And if someone is paralyzed, chemically paralyzed, I should say that, then chemically paralyzed with um, muscle relaxants such as vericonium, cisatricurium, atricurium, you know, just to name a few. Um, because otherwise, if they're being prone, for example, they couldn't tolerate the proning without being paralyzed. But when you paralyze someone, um, it also takes longer for them to wake up from my experience. So there's a number of factors that you need to take into consideration when someone is in an induced coma in ICU and the stages of coming out of it, right? Other things you need to take into consideration is age, right? If someone, the more, the older someone is, you know, the, um, Generally speaking, the longer it takes for them to wake up could be a case of, you know, slower metabolism for someone who's older, could be a number of reasons. You know, again, like I mentioned briefly earlier, if someone is in kidney failure, if someone is in liver failure, generally speaking, it takes longer for them to wake up as well. You could also say that if someone is overweight and is in a prolonged induced coma, you could say it also takes longer for them to wake up because often you know, especially benzodiazepines or opiates are stored in the tissue, tissues, and then it takes longer for the body to eliminate them. And therefore, there's a delay in waking up. Okay, when I talked about 
when I talk about um, proning, you know, I also need to now talk about the RAS score in ICU. I don't want to get to a medical, you know, the RAS score is generally speaking something that is for doctors and for nurses in ICU to, to assess the depth of a coma. But I do believe I need to talk about it because, you know, uh, it helps you understand how the depth of an induced coma is measured. It helps you understand, you know, what it looks like for your end, helps you do your own research. I, I'm a big believer that, you know, the more you understand, the better. Um, and if someone is in an induced coma and needs to be proned, you definitely need to look at the RAS score. So the RAS score goes from minus five to plus four. Minus five basically means that, you know, someone is not reacting to anything. Uh, someone is, you know, pretty much what looks like in a vegetative state. Now, I, do, I, I don't like to use the term, but you know, when you look at the technical term, it says unrousing, unra RAS of minus five is unrousable, no response to voice or physical stimulation. And this is what you need when someone, for example, is prone, you know, you don't want them to feel that they're prone, especially if they're critically ill, you know, you don't want that. Next, other patients that often get induced into a coma and paralyzed are patients that are not synchronizing the ventilator. They're breathing against the ventilator for whatever reason, you know, again, being ventilated with a breathing tube is very uncomfortable. And, um, you know, you need to uh, look at those situations. What do you need to do? Is sedation of morphine, if morphine, fentanyl, midazolam, propofol, presidex, is that going to be enough? When someone is resisting ventilation, someone is resisting mechanical ventilation. And if someone is resisting mechanical ventilation and they have respiratory failure, it doesn't matter whether it's type one or type two, respiratory failure, um, you know, you need to counteract that because otherwise the patient is at risk of deterioration, potentially respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, and you name it. So then you need to look at, <laughs> I'm sorry, we need to look at, um, again, paralyzing a patient again, you know, and if we need to paralyze a patient again, um, you know, does that help us achieve the goal? If it does help us achieve the goal of adequate mechanical ventilation, what are the side effects of that? Well, the side effects, again, is we're using a lot of sedation and opiates to keep the patient cooperative, if you will, uh, so we can conduct the therapies. Um, and But it also comes with the side effect that, again, the combination of uh, chemical paralyzing agents, chemical restraints, and heavily induced coma takes longer to wake up. And again, you've got to consider age, you know, got to consider body weight and so forth. Got to consider is there is liver intact, kidneys intact and so forth. Now, let's look at the RAS score. Let's go through the RAS score quickly as an next step. Minus five. So again, RAS score goes from minus five, which is unrousable, to plus four, which is combative. You don't want either. Uh, so let's just quickly go through the stages. Minus five is unrousable, no response to voice or physical stimulation. Minus four is deep sedation, no response to voice, but movement or eye opening to physical stimulation. Minus three is moderate sedation, movement or eye opening to voice, but no eye contact. Minus two is light sedation, briefly awakens with eye contact to voice, less than 10 seconds. Minus one is drowsy. Not fully alert, but has sustained awakening, eye opening, eye contact to voice for greater than 10 seconds. Then we've got a zero, which is alert and calm. Then we've got plus one, which is restless, anxious, but movements not aggressive or vigorous. Plus two, agitation, frequent non purposeful movement, fights, ventilator. Plus three, very agitated pulls or removes tubes or catheters, aggressive, and for combative, overtly combative, violent, immediate danger to staff. Right. So you can see, you know, that it's sort of a fine line to walk between a minus five and a plus four, you know, looks good on with numbers, but you can see 
it's uh, sort of a, a fine line people need to walk okay so next so coming back to you know what does it look like if someone wakes up out of an induced coma you know you're not using unrousable for every patient in icu you might you know in, in icu nowadays you know the doctors would usually say hey i want a, a ras of minus three for this patient for the next 24 hours and then maybe the next day if the patient keeps improving i want a ras of minus two and then the next day i want a ras of minus one and then you know move towards extubation that is the ideal scenario now here is unfortunately what often happens in icu of course you know you have the goal of taking the breathing tube out again the technical term there is extubation you take the sedatives off and even sometimes with propofol if you take propofol off who's short-term acting in theory patient should wake up very quickly patient is not waking up not doing what what they're supposed to be doing and often the reason for patients not waking up even even though you're using short-term acting sedatives is simply you know a they're critically ill so there could simply be a delay because they're critically ill and b it also depends on how many opiates have been used you know has morphine been used has fentanyl been used over what periods of times how much fentanyl how much morphine has been used now opiates such as morphine or fentanyl the main side effect is uh, respiratory depression or one of the main side effects is respiratory depression now what does what does that mean for someone on a ventilator well it's almost counter in, counterproductive to put someone on morphine or fentanyl for pain with the side effect of having respiratory depression because um you know then they're waking up you want to wean them off a ventilator and they're still depressed from a respiratory point of view because they had all this all all, all the morphine and the fentanyl for example so you can see where I'm going with this. That's why, you know, weaning someone off a ventilator, especially after prolonged ventilation, is more of an art than a science, you know. Um, and it's also critically important that you wean someone off a ventilator as quickly as possible. You know, there's deconditioning going on, muscle wastage. You know, the longer you have someone on a ventilator, the longer it takes for them to wake up, you know. Um, next. So... Let's just take sometimes patients, not very many, but sometimes patients are only sedated with propofol and they don't have morphine or midazolam. Uh, they don't have morphine or fentanyl. That's actually a good thing because then ideally you have switch off the propofol, patients wake up and you can ideally extubate them very, very quickly. Okay, let's just quickly look at when you have a patient on uh, midazolam and morphine, you know, or midazolam and fentanyl. So, you know, again, if you need someone in an induced coma in ICU for a prolonged period, you often switch over from propofol and opiates to midazolam and opiates, you know. Um, usually, and again, midazolam is long-term acting versus propofol short-term acting. So, you, and also, you know, if you need, for example, instead of using 200 milligrams or 20, 20 mils per hour of propofol, you might only need three or four mils an hour, three or four milligrams an hour of midazolam. So to a degree, you can use less sedation to achieve the same or a better outcome. But then again, you have the added on complication that if you use midazolam and morphine or fentanyl over many days, and you wake then, or you wake someone up from an induced coma, you have to gradually reduce midazolam or verset. The other term is verset for midazolam. You have to slowly reduce verset midazolam, but also morphine or fentanyl because they're addictive in nature. You can't just switch it off. You can switch off propofol, but you can't just switch off morphine or midazolam or fentanyl. You have to gradually reduce them, often half them day by day. Okay, so... Um, because you don't want the patient to withdraw from those medications. Again, midazolam or said is a benzodiazepine, morphine and fentanyl are opiates. Both medications are addictive in nature. Right. So next. So then you switch it off. You know, ideally your RAS keeps improving, keeps going up. 
by the same token, you know, um, if it's not improving, then you've got to be very patient, you know, because again, like I've said many times, waking up after an induced coma is not like switching on a light. It's more like switching on a light with a dimmer. On top of that, you have, you know, the reasons for inducing someone in a coma is a critical illness. If someone is critically ill, they're exhausted, they're tired, they are sick, they're very sick. So, you know, they're often patients after an induced coma are often not waking up because they're simply tired. You know, they're crook. You know, they're very sick and they just take their time to wake up. So therefore, it's often very, you know, very difficult to put timelines on how long it takes to wake up after an induced coma. I've seen patients, you know, I see they wake up within hours. I've seen patients, you know, I see you, they wake up within days. And I've seen patients in ICU, they wake up within weeks, sometimes months. So again, it's not a one size fits all. Unfortunately, it's not a one size fits all. Um, so what else needs to happen? Obviously, you need to assess the RAS score and you can do that yourself. You can Google the RAS score, you know, it's not rocket science. <coughs> Next, you can... Um, Google the RAS score, have a look for yourself. You should also check GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale. You can also look that one up. Again, it's a neurological assessment tool that will give you an indication of where your loved one is at. Again, it's not rocket science. You can do the assessment yourself uh, when you look at the score. Um, so what else needs to happen? If you want to wake up someone after an induced coma and they're not waking up, following things need to happen. Sit them up 30 degrees, sometimes 45 degrees. Start doing physical therapy, physiotherapy. Start doing move, movements of legs and so forth. Um, talk to them, talk to patients, of course, stimulate them, ask them if they can hear you, you know, ask them to squeeze your hands, give them a wash, give them a bed bath, do um, things such as um, brushing their teeth, washing their back, you know, that is the ideal scenario. And then move them forward from a ventilation point of view. You know, we haven't talked much about ventilation today. And I don't want to focus on ventilation. I've done plenty of other videos where I'm focusing on ventilation, even though both goes hand in hand. This is really about, you know, what does it look like for someone to wake up? Now, initially, someone in an induced coma is in a controlled ventilation mode, like SIMV or CMV, where the machine is doing all the work. And as patients wake up, you change them over to CPAP or pressure support. You do the spontaneous breathing trials, and then ideally you extubate them after they are more awake, after they've shown they've got a good strong cough, after they've shown their brain is intact by them obeying commands, you know, and so forth. So that is what needs to happen. So if patients don't wake up after an induced coma for whatever reason, the next step is to rule out a neurological event. So for example, if you can confidently say, you know, patients not waking up for whatever reason, you've done all the right things, you've switched off, sedatives, you know, you switched off opiates, they're not going through a withdrawal, you know, but they're still not waking up. You give them physical therapy, you do sit them up, you talk to them, you wash them, you do mouth care, you know, you do all the right things and people are, patients are still not waking up. Their RAS is still a minus five or a minus four. Their classical coma scale is still a three to five. What's next? What's next in a situation like that is you need to rule out a neurological event. What do I mean by that? So worst case scenario in an induced coma is that a neurological event happens such as, God forbid, your loved one sustains a stroke. Your loved one is having seizures un unbeknownst to you know, the doctors and the nurses because you can't really see them because patients are heavily sedated. So then if someone is not waking up, you, know, you need to do a CT scan of the brain. You need to do an MRI scan of the brain. You might potentially need and need to do an EEG. You might need to seek a neurological consult to simply rule out a stroke, 
seizures, brain infarct, you know, you name it, brain bleed, you know. So because you need to rule out that not waking up is not secondary to a neurological event, right? I hope that makes sense. But, you know, you should always give a patient a couple of days, at least, you know, at least. It takes three or four days, I'd say, well, you know, let's go for a CT scan of the brain, let's go for an MRI scan of the brain, let's do an EEG, let's go for a neuro neurological consult. So, I think, um, I do believe that wraps it up for today. I do want to quickly talk about the Presidex again. Again, from my experience, Presidex is sort of a very mixed bag in my mind. Um, you know, if you have experience with Presidex, please, you know, leave your comments below. I'm very happy to learn more about it, even though I have used it many times. From my experience, it was only working on maybe one or two out of 10 patients that I looked after with Presidex. And if it works, it works well. Uh, and patients, you know, don't need a long time to wake up, generally speaking, again, assuming there's no neurological event. So that's, that's where I want to leave it today. You know, if you have any questions, comments, leave them below. Um, you know, I will answer those questions and comments. Um, now, if you have a loved one in intensive care, go to intensivecarehotline.com, call us on one of the numbers on the top of our website, or simply leave us an email or send us an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Also, if you uh, also have a look at our membership for families in intensive care at intensivecaresupport.org. There you have access to me and my team 24 hours a day in a membership area and via email, and we answer all questions intensive care related. If you need a medical record review for your loved one in intensive care or after intensive care, we can help you with that as well. We strongly recommend that we help you with a medical record review while your loved one is in intensive care so we can really interpret live data. But we can also help you obviously with a medical rec record review after intensive care. If you have trouble getting access to medical rec records, please contact us. We can 100% help you. Thanks for watching the video. I would appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel for regular updates for families in intensive care. Um, please share the video with your friends and families. Click the like button, click the notification bell and comment below what you want to see next or what questions and insights you have. Um, again, thanks for watching. I'll see you again this week with my quick tip videos as well as with another YouTube live stream next uh, Sunday, 10.30 a.m. Sydney, Melbourne time, which is 6.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the U.S., which is 3.30 p.m. Pacific time uh, in the U.S. I look forward to seeing you then. Take care for now.